to the fighter pilot. Speed is life. This credo means harnessing the full power of their machine to outfly and outgun their opponent. Revolutionary technology takes fighter aircraft from the prop age to the jet age. From the verge of stall speed to beyond the sound barrier. Now, you're in the cockpit as ultra-fast fighters use speed as a weapon against lethal opponents. Culminating in the first supersonic gun kill in history. Experience the battle. Dissect the tactics. Relive the dogfights. January 21st, 1944. Under the pitch black cloak of night, a Royal Canadian Air Force mosquito skims across the English Channel. Its pilot is an American, Lou Luma. Going over the channel was like being inside of a black barrel. I mean, you didn't see anything. You didn't know where up was or down was or anything. Luma and his navigator, Lieutenant Colin Finlayson, are night intruders. Their mission, attack German aircraft right at their doorstep. The psychological advantage was great. They knew every time they came home that there was an intruder hanging around the airport. Luma's Mosquito advances to Hildesheim Air Base in Germany. Without radar, Luma has to depend on visual cues to spot his prey. He could look for the exhaust fires from their engines. He could look for the guy that forgot to turn his lights off or turned his lights on for some uh, silly reason. Within minutes, an outgoing enemy pilot exposes himself with a costly mistake. He's left his lights on. The navigator spotted this one white light coming toward us. We had a white light in the nose and a white light in the tail. A Messerschmitt 410, and it's climbing fast. Luma stays low, undetected. As the German plane passes overhead, Luma cranks his mosquito into a sharp 180. He has to gain ground quickly before the German fighter reaches his target. Adrenaline surges through Luma's veins as he races toward his enemy. The two Merlins of mine with the throttles pushed all the way forward to catch him. I didn't want him to get away. In his excitement, Luma closes too fast. He's about to overshoot the German. At that point in time, I'm just sick at the stomach. I think, God, I'm screwing this up. Luma slams down the landing gear and throws his mosquito into a series of hard turns to drain airspeed. He manages to stay behind his prey. He opens up with all eight guns. As soon as you do it, there's an explosion. And then just ram the nose forward to avoid flying through all this debris. Later, Luma learns that the German pilot he defeated was a Luftwaffe ace. He had shot down five British bombers that night, and he had landed to get more fuel. In his excitement, he left those lights on. 
Luma speeds away into the shadows, a victorious night fighter. The mosquito has inflicted its deadly sting. The de Havilland DH-98 Mosquito is one of the fastest airframes of World War II. A lightweight wooden frame wedded to twin 1,700 horsepower Merlin engines. The wooden wonder, as it became known, could reach speeds well over 400 miles per hour. There's nothing, nothing that was built then that would would uh, be able to catch you. Its performance and its massive firepower of four 20 millimeter cannon and four 30 caliber machine guns made the Mosquito a force to be reckoned with. They could go on any number of utility missions and combat missions as well. Weather reconnaissance, photo reconnaissance, attack missions where they would actually put bombs on things. They could go on strafing missions down low. One such strafing mission will take Mosquito pilot Lou Luma from the murky shroud of darkness into the revealing light of day. March 24, 1944, Luma's Canadian Air Force Mosquito again steals across the English Channel. It's a rare daylight appearance for the plane and its pilot. It had what they called daylight rangers. These were trips that they would let us go out in daytime, two aircraft at a time. You had to plan your own trip. Today, Luma's target is an air base on the French-German border. The idea was they would go in unannounced, by surprise, with lots of speed, make one pass, wreak all kinds of destruction, and then get out of there. Less than five miles from the airfield, Luma spots a bogey. It's a JU-37, a single-engine trainer. The Mosquito pilot knows that he must jump his enemy before any alarm can be raised. He creeps into position. Luma's eight weapons bark to life. The German trainer disintegrates under the combined weight of fire. He probably never, ever knew what hit him. Luma continues to the airfield at about 400 miles per hour. As he approaches, Luma spots scores of targets. Aircraft and gliders parked in the shape of an L along the flight line. We predetermined that we were gonna only going to make two passes down the one circle to get in line for the other row and then get out of there. Get in, hit them quick, and get out quick. The mosquitoes wade through the ground tunnels ensuring the enemy planes will never claim kills of their own. successful mission. But halfway to the English Channel, Luma spots a new target. And then we saw Junkers 52 have an old tri-motor transport. And that was a tough old bird.
Bonuma breaks for the safety of England. He lands home having scored his fifth victory. He remains the only American Mosquito ace and a prime example of a fighter pilot using speed as a weapon. You know, Luke could be writing some rules of thumb for today's intruder pilots and attack pilots. The Mosquito earned a reputation in the European theater for its rapid speed and its hard-hitting armament. But in the Pacific, another aircraft will earn its place in history as the fastest Allied fighter of the war. April 22, 1945. F-4U Corsairs of the U.S. Marine Corps patrol off the coast of Okinawa. Flight leader Lieutenant Jerry O'Keefe and his men are part of VMF-323, the Death Rattlers. They have been tasked with a special late war mission to seek out and destroy Japanese kamikazes before they strike home on American ships. We had been patrolling above the picket ships for over two hours without any activity and no enemy planes in the area. All of a sudden, we were notified by the picket ship below us that a large number of uh, enemy aircraft were coming down uh, from the north, from uh, 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 the direction of Japan. A swarm of suicide aircraft rattles toward the American fleet. They begin to loosen their formation and disperse in an effort to present fewer targets to the advanced American fighters patrolling the area. One such patrol, led by Jerry O'Keefe, is high above and closing fast. If your advantage over the enemy is, say, 50 or 60 miles per hour in speed, it makes very little sense to get involved in a turning contest with them. Instead, use an altitude advantage, dive in a high-speed pass, pick your shot, fire, and use that momentum to zoom again and retain your altitude advantage. O'Keefe picks a target out of the pack, a slow-moving Val dive bomber at 2 o'clock low. Anxiously, O'Keefe slams his throttle to the firewall and dives, determined to land the first punch. April 22, 1945. Corsair pilot Jerry O'Keefe is diving fast on a kamikaze. The Japanese plane fills his gun sight. O'Keefe rolls in and does a classic gun run on it like he did in the training command. So he makes one pass at this valve and disintegrates it with a 50 cal. O'Keefe levels off with six more VALs ahead of him. His powerful Corsair will have no trouble catching up to the lumbering dive bombers. The D-3A2 VAL is the primary dive bomber of the Imperial Japanese Navy. But with fixed landing gear and a weak 1,300 horsepower engine, the VAL is not much of a dogfighter. The F-4U Corsair is the most advanced fighter in the Pacific. Identifiable for its innovative gull wing design, the Corsair earned a reputation for its searing combination of speed and firepower. The Corsair was uh, far superior than uh, uh, any plane really in combat that the Japanese had at that point. The Corsair's power comes from the legendary R-2800 radial engine, the same engine that powered the F-6F Hellcat and the P-47 Thunderbolt. 
Yar 2800 in the uh, World War II fighters. What a fantastically reliable, capable, powerful aircraft engine. Tremendous ability to put out power. The Corsair can top 440 miles per hour, making it the fastest fighter then in service with the armed forces. Now, Corsair pilot Jerry O'Keefe is using his aircraft's trademark speed to close the gap on six Japanese VAL dive bombers. I was behind them, and it was my intention to shoot all six of them down, but it didn't work out that way. O'Keefe sights up the leader and pulls the trigger. And I missed him. And he left the formation and turned sharply to the left. And I decided I was going to stay with him until we settled that matter. The Val dives into the clouds. O'Keefe doggedly pursues. I had put my landing flaps down a little bit so I wouldn't run past him. Finally, the Val pilot's luck runs out. There just wasn't enough cloud cover for him to get into. And then I had a, you know, a dead-on shot from the stern. He just blew up, you know. As O'Keefe returns to the fight, another Val comes screaming right at him. We went past like this, and then we both turned into uh, each other to try to get an advantage. This kamikaze pilot has the heart of a dogfighter. The two aircraft engage in a deadly low-speed scissors above the water, taking O'Keefe to the wavering edge of stall speed. O'Keefe is, is lowering his flaps, slowing down. This is a valve that can fly actually probably slower than he can, trying to pull inside of it. On the second pass, O'Keefe lands a few hits. The dive bomber smokes but its pilot refuses to back down. The kamikaze noses up, intent on ramming the Corsair. I guess he realized, uh, you know, that he was, uh, he was gone and uh, wanted to take me with him, and I didn't want to go. O'Keefe desperately yanks the stick back. So I pulled up and was able to avoid him. But it was very, very close, and I was very, extremely scared. <laughs> the valve noses over and plunges into the water. It's a hard-fought third victory for O'Keefe. The American pitches up, knowing he can trade altitude for speed. Leveling off at nearly 10,000 feet, he spots another valve below. The next engagement that he has is very similar to his first engagement. He looks and sees a bogey down low to a clock. The kamikaze pilot doesn't see it coming. Some of those pilots didn't seem to see other aircraft. They uh, were oblivious to what was about to happen to them in most cases. O'Keefe accelerates, does another classic training command style uh, gun firing pass at high speed, and gets the kill on the first pass. As O'Keefe climbs away from his fourth victory, he spots a lone Val off in the distance. No doubt on an attack run against the American fleet. With O'Keefe's engagements against the kamikazes at Okinawa, the great limiting factor 
is the amount of ammunition that he has in the aircraft. Low on ammo, O'Keefe uses his best asset, speed. O'Keefe trains his sight pipper, takes a breath, then fires. With only a handful of 50 caliber rounds left in his guns, First Lieutenant Jerry O'Keefe becomes an ace in a day by splashing five kamikazes. The other death rattlers bring the day's total to 17. Not a single kamikaze successfully strikes the fleet. O'Keefe and the death rattlers, they save thousands of lives by blunting those assaults coming in. And that we, we owe them a tremendous, a tremendous uh, debt of gratitude for that. The F-4U Corsair proved itself to be the consummate war machine of the Pacific Theater. But the end of World War II brings with it a quantum leap in technology. Pilots trained to harness the power of piston engines now had to adapt to the blistering speed of jets. The Korean War ushers in the jet age of air combat, where speed becomes a major factor in turning the tide for the Allies. December 17, 1950, four F-86A Sabre jets knife through the icy skies of North Korea. It is one of the first combat missions for the new swept-wing fighter. The stakes could not be higher. Before the F-86s came on, we're flying straight-wing F-80s. Good airplane, good flying qualities, uh, but no match for the MiG-15s. The MiG-15s came on the scene. We were putting bombers over the north, and they were getting chewed up. We had to get air superiority, and the F-86 was the aircraft to do that for us. Lieutenant Colonel Bruce Hinton leads the mission. The North Koreans are unaware that the Americans are fielding new aircraft, and Hinton plans to keep it that way. We were cruising at a low airspeed to imitate F-80s to entice the MiG to show up and combat us. There's a saying in fighter aviation and dogfighting, if you're not cheating, you're not trying. So luring the enemy up for a fight, creating deception is all legal and it's all encouraged and it's anything you can do to get them going. In a matter of minutes, the enemy air force takes the bait. Hinton's wingman calls out bogeys crossing the Yalu River at nine o'clock and closing fast. Four gleaming MiG-15s bore into the attack. The fastest dogfight of the new jet age is about to kick off. December 17, 1950. Sabre pilot Bruce Hinton keeps his cool. He's got enemy MiGs approaching his flight at breakneck speed, but he wants to lure them in close before he strikes. All we knew is we had to attack first. If they got on our tails, we'd have trouble. One thing you don't want to have is a MiG-15 on your tail. At all. <laughs> Ever. <laughs> Ground control orders the MiG pilots to get a closer look at the American fighters before they engage. As they pass beneath the four sabers, the North Koreans catch sight of the swept wing design. And to the MiG's chagrin, here's his airplane sitting there that were every bit as high performance as they were. The MiG itself was actually slightly slower than the F-86. The American trap is sprung. Well, upon sighting the MiGs as they were crossing underneath us, I call drop tanks now, and we all drop our external tanks. At that point, uh, I turned the maneuver. Breaking right, Hinton firewalls the throttle. We had to pick up speed from what we were cruising at. I had to pour on the coal to get the airplane moving. 
So we had to pick up speed and pick up maybe the .85 or something like that. Hinton's flight noses down and swings in on the enemy's five o'clock, closing fast. The lightweight MiG can outclimb the Sabre and boasts harder hitting cannon. The Sabre has a slight edge in top speed and its heavier airframe allows it to approach Mach 1 in a dive. They both had strengths and weaknesses relative to one another that tended to cancel each other out. At jet speeds, suddenly everybody is butting up against the sonic barrier. And at about Mach 0.94 or thereabouts, everybody's capable of doing the same speed. So what did that do? That took us back into the turning arena. The MiG flight splits defensively. Hinton's targets, the MiG leader and his wingman, break left. They commit a cardinal error. They reverse their turn. So Hinton slides right in for a gun's kill. Now, here's a, a very uh, capable and qualified uh, gunnery pilot. Hinton's airspeed indicates 0.95 Mach, the knife edge of the speed of sound. He selects his target. Well, I picked the lead guy for the man I ought to attack. But then as I maneuvered, I said, I'm going to get on the closest one. At about 1,500 feet, he pulls the trigger. I could see the hits bouncing off his airplane, or at least reflecting off his airplane. But he didn't do anything. He just stayed there, and I, so I kept firing. The North Korean pilot frantically pops his speed brakes. At that point, the bogey does a second incredible error, and that's to try to slow down, maybe to spit him out, maybe to make him overshoot the turn. I had to slow down to keep stay on his tail. I didn't want to get ahead of him. Hinton almost overshoots him, comes directly underneath the belly of the aircraft, five feet from him, so he can look up and see the rivets, and he's just hanging in there. The desperate MiG driver wings over and dives, hoping the American will turn him loose. No such luck. I followed him and followed him, and I let him have a long burst. And that's a lot of 50 caliber slugs. Well, at that point, he looked like he was really out of control. The MiG plummets into the snow-covered ground below. The rest of the MiGs use their climbing speed advantage to bug out of the fight. They just fire all the throttle and soon climb, and the F-86s couldn't keep up with them. Hinton has drawn first blood for the F-86 Sabre. Within weeks, air superiority over North Korea again belongs to the Allies. Though still considered a subsonic airframe, the F-86 proves that speed is often the decisive factor in aerial warfare. As the science of high-speed flight becomes more thoroughly understood, the next generation of fighter aircraft incorporates technology and design elements that make the sound barrier a thing of the past. In the hostile skies over North Vietnam, ultra-high-speed interceptors like the F-4 Phantom make their combat debut. And one skilled Phantom crew will bet it all in an attempt to score the first supersonic gun kill in history. June 2nd, 1972, Thud Ridge, 
an elaborate rescue operation is underway to save Roger Locker, an F-4 Phantom crewman downed northeast of Hanoi 23 days prior. Major Phil Handley and backseater Jack Smallwood lead Brenda flight, four F-4 Phantoms tasked with keeping enemy MiGs at bay while the rescue ships go in. A massive raid was laid on because that super jolly green giant and those prop-driven spads, A-1s, are gonna have to go in there right into the jaws of hell up by the doorstep of Hanoi to pick him up. After several uneventful passes around the recovery zone, Handley's cockpit comes alive with a 1,000 hertz rattle that can mean only one thing, a surface-to-air missile launch. Handley turns into the alarm, scanning for telltale dust and debris. The SA-2 is a rather simplistic missile which you could defeat easily if you could see it in time. So we turn into it. We can't pick them up. I see no missiles, we don't see anything. A false alarm, but the SAM threat has forced the flight to expend precious fuel. It was a typical day in that we were running out of fuel tanks. I was the only one of the four aircraft that had a centerline tank on it, 600 gallon centerline tank. Handley's element leader calls bingo fuel. He must break off with his wingman and head for a tanker leaving only Handley and wingman Buddy Green to finish the cap. And just then, a warning from radar control. He said, uh, Brenda one, he said, this is worm. You have bandits one, two, one, two, three at eight, 123 degrees at eight miles. MiGs closing fast from four o'clock low, hell bent on killing the Americans. June 2nd, 1972, Major Phil Handley and wingman Buddy Green have some unwanted company. Enemy MiGs on their tail. Handley breaks hard into the threat. My backseater, Jack Smallwood, is doing everything to try to lock these guys up, but it's a look-down angle, and these aren't pulse Doppler radars in those days. Looking down into ground clutter is like looking into clabbered milk. The situation quickly goes from bad to worse. We're not picking them up. And just as we're getting close, my wingman uh, buddy calls bingo. Handley's wingman needs to egress and refuel. The flight lead knows that separating could be deadly. The Americans disengage and head toward the Gulf of Tonkin. But on a routine check of his wingman six, Handley spots something. I see this glint of light behind Buddy down low about 4 o'clock. Well, MiGs are silver at the time, and nothing could be producing a glint of light other than a silver MiG. The Major orders his wingman to cross to his right wing, allowing him a better view. At a range of about 8,000 feet, uh, there they were, bigger than Dallas, two silver MiG-19s, perfect sharp bearing aircraft. The MiG-19 is small, agile, and armed with three 30-millimeter cannon. Its twin engines each pump out over 7,000 pounds of thrust, making it the first supersonic fighter in the Soviet arsenal. The F-4E is the Air Force's ultimate version of the venerable Phantom II. Originally designed for Navy fleet defense, the Phantom's role evolved into that of a dogfighter during the Vietnam War. To that end, the E model is equipped with an internal 20 millimeter cannon in addition to missiles. But the Phantom's reputation is built on raw power. Its twin J-79 engines pump out nearly 18,000 pounds of thrust each allowing the massive fighter to double the speed of sound. The F-4 Phantom is truly the performance aircraft of its generation. And it comes to its own at high speeds. Uh, when you get that aircraft above 475 knots in a turn, it just keeps wanting to accelerate. In a dogfight, the MiG-19 is more maneuverable but the Phantom has a huge advantage in speed and weapons systems. 
Now, Phil Handley is faced with a mortal decision. His wingman's fuel tank is running dry, but he wants to take a crack at those MiGs. I said, uh, Brenda, two, you continue on out. I'm going to take one run at this guy. And he's in a voice just calmer than you can imagine. He said, he casually said, I'll stay with you. Handley throws his J-79 engines into full burner and cranks back toward the MiGs. An incredible 9G pull. I was so full of adrenaline, I don't recall pulling any Gs whatsoever, but I slammed uh, over 9 Gs on the airplane. And that, supported by God's radio G, I really just came around quick on these guys. In his dive, Handley's Phantom goes supersonic. The idea was to keep their energy up and to fly faster and use the advantages that the Phantom had. I went through the mock at, at the 90 degree point and never came out of afterburner. So in the next minute and 42 seconds, I traded a half a ton of JP-4 and three miles of altitude for airspeed in pursuit of this guy. While Handley dives, wingman Green climbs sharply to gain altitude and conserve fuel. The MiG leader makes a critical mistake. He climbs after Green, allowing Handley to slip past and line up a missile shot from behind. Handley rolls out on the Bandit 6. He puts a five-mile bore sight on the leader and ripple fires his two radar-guided AIM-7 Sparrows. The first one, the rocket motor didn't ignite, just fell off. The second one took off and didn't guide, just went into a moonshot. Handley is closing at nearly twice his enemy's speed. If he continues like that, he'll overshoot them. He wants to take that energy, keep the speed without slowing down, and just fly a bigger distance through the air. And if he pulls the nose up, makes a large corkscrew maneuver, and then back around, he will have flown the equivalent of five times the distance that the MiGs have flown. So that's how he keeps his airspeed and also keeps him in geometric position on his pursuit. Handley's radar-guided missiles are gone. He's down to his two heat seekers, the notoriously ill-performing AIM-4 Falcons. It was a hit-to-kill missile, but it's all ahead. So I slapped it down. The tone in your headset says the missiles are looking because it sounds like a Norelco Razor. The lock tone sizzles in his headset. The time is now. Handley pushes the button and fires. June 2nd, 1972. Major Phil Handley launches his last two missiles at a pair of MiG-19s. But again, technology fails him. One of them never came off the rail, and the other one went up in a moonshot. Left with only his 20 millimeter cannon and closing at over 900 miles per hour, Phil Handley is locked into a Mach speed version of a classic dogfight. He will attempt the first supersonic gun kill in history. Handley's a guy that had a game plan that didn't count on anything working. So now he's just been let down by all the technology that American Missile Re has, has to give him. Does he give up? No, he has kept himself in the position. Handley is here. The lead MiG and his wingman are here. Though he has kept himself in a pursuit position, Handley must now get a firing angle. An airplane turning that isn't jinking around has a, has a plane, an imaginary plane that sticks right vertically perpendicular to his canopy out. If you can get into that plane of motion ahead of him, and have a bullet stream laying out there and he doesn't move, he'll fly through that stream. The lead MiG-19 breaks hard right. Handley witnesses his enemy's awesome agility firsthand. A MiG-19 is a very fast turning airplane. There's no way that I can 
do any sort of a lag maneuver or stay inside his turn, so now I'm down to a high deflection shot uh, with the cannon. Handley pulls hard right. He thunders toward the slower moving MiG at a speed equivalent to four and a half football fields per second. There is no room for error. If he misses with his last weapon, he will overshoot and make himself the target. As Handley begins to pull lead, he struggles to keep a visual on his enemy. The long nose of the Phantom obscures the MiG. You cannot point out directly ahead of him because that nose obscures him, so you must carry him down here in this quarter panel here, it's just below the plane of motion. And he's coming around. At the last moment, I roll up and then back down in the plane of motion, held down the trigger. A quick three-second burst. Three hundred and ten twenty-millimeter rounds hurtle into the MiG's line of flight. That twenty-millimeter stream walked right down. The first one hit up in the left wing root. The next one, I saw it hit the wing root, uh, left nose, canopy, wing root, tail. And just, just that fast. And uh, as quick as I passed him, my quarter rolled and zoomed. Handley glances back. There was flames and uh, fluids and big chunks falling off of him, and he was flopping around. The MiG crashes into the jungle. After a series of frustrating misses, Phil Handley scores. And there must have been 25 fighter pilots up in Route Package 6 all hollering, you know, and shouting. And I, last one I recognized my squadron commander, old John Dice, said, way to go. The MiG wingman rolls in on Handley 6, but the American is going too fast and easily climbs away. Arriving at base, Handley learns that the rescue mission he supported was a success. We went back to Udorn Channel 70, and there was the greatest celebration you've ever seen, because there's old, there's old uh, Roger Locker. You know, they got him out. Handley's role in the rescue mission is historic. With an indicated airspeed of Mach 1.2, his victory is the first and only recorded gun kill at supersonic speed. Most modern fighter aircraft are capable of surpassing Mach 2, indicating that speed and life continue to be one and the same. The question now becomes, how fast is fast enough? The question you have to ask yourself is, once you have a Mach 3 fighter or interceptor, what are you going to do with it? Because unless the enemy has a Mach 2.8 interceptor or fighter aircraft, what are the relative advantages of your airplane over whatever anybody else might have parked on the runway at the same time? Today's air combat tacticians are often more interested in the performance of an aircraft's weapon systems than the performance of the plane itself. You have very powerful, reliable radars, you have jam-proof communications, and you have very reliable, proven, long-range, lethal missiles. Technology will continue to shape air combat. But if you ask the fighter pilot, speed still matters. If you give a fighter pilot a choice between performance and smooth handling qualities, he or she will pick performance every day of the week. On Yankee Station, Pilots of the USS Midway launch into the skies of Southeast Asia. Over Vietnam, 
they face a fiery crucible of unrelenting combat. The men of this remarkable carrier will make history, scoring the first and last MiG kill of the war. Using state-of-the-art computer animation, you're in the cockpit as pilots of the Midway go head-to-head -head against skilled and determined foes. Experience the battle. Dissect the tactics. Relive the dogfights with the MiG killers of Midway. June 17, 1965, the early days of the Vietnam War. Strike aircraft launch from the deck of the USS Midway on Yankee Station, 100 miles from the North Vietnamese coast. The aircraft assemble over the Gulf and push into North Vietnam. They'll hit the Tan Hoa Railroad Bridge, a strike meant to slow the movement of supplies to the south. Among them are two F-4 Phantoms led by Commander Lou Page with his radar intercept officer, or Rio, Lieutenant J.C. Smith in the back seat. Our mission as the F-4 fighters was a tar cap. We were target, cap, in front of the target to the NAR. The target combat air patrol stays close to the target to intercept hostile enemy aircraft. Page and Smith's wingman is Lieutenant Dave Batson with his Rio, Lieutenant Commander Rob DeRemus. These aviators from the USS Midway have a date with destiny. On this mission, they will score the first MiG kills of the Vietnam War. The attack boys had done their thing. They had just called feet wet, and I said, let's make one more orbit. We were about 12,000 feet, maybe 13,000 feet. And we turn the orbit, and just as we sweep about 360 with the nose of the airplane, two targets pop up. That's good. Now. Was it Navy? I don't think so. We didn't have that many Navy out there. Was it Air Force? Oh, I don't know, but I'm hoping we got to look at it. This early in the war, there is no way to ID the contacts electronically. They'll have to get a visual. The bogeys are at 11 o'clock, 2,000 feet up, range 32 miles. Page and Smith begin the shadow boxing by making a slight turn to the right, coaxing the bogeys to turn towards them. The Americans curve away, but the bogeys don't bite. The Phantoms roll back to the left, taking a more aggressive tack. What do I want to happen? I want those MiGs to turn into me. Fingernail trip. Right now, you can't see if my fingernails are dirty. If he turns into me, you can see if my fingernails are dirty. Smith orders Batson and Doremus into a trail position. They whoop, drop back. Didn't say how far he knew. He should be a mile and a half to two miles behind us in trail. In the front, Page and Smith will gain positive visual ID on the bogeys. Batson and Doremus will target the lead contact on radar and fire as soon as it is confirmed hostile. Page and Smith will target the second bogey. Going in, then I go to ICS, intercom. I said, Lou, you should be right on your nose. Right on your nose, just slightly above. I didn't want to put him on the nose and put him under him. All of a sudden, he said, Tally-ho, four. 
That's the first I knew there for. He said, Migs, Migs, because the old boy turned like this into us. Round wing tips, dirty fingernails. The contacts are confirmed hostile. Four MiG 17s in two elements. They're already locked up and in range for the Phantom Sparrow missiles. I said, shoot, shoot, shoot. You never say fire in an airplane. I heard just whoop. I felt the missile leave the airplane. Page and Smith's missile slams into the MiG 17. explosion takes down the MiG's wingman. I heard, Bula Bula, that means a hit. And at the same time I looked out, Phew! here goes the Sparrow missile across my starboard wing from old Batman that was in the back. Batson's missile strikes the second MiG element. Again, debris knocks out the wingman. The Phantom pilots have struck an historic blow. The war's first kills of North Vietnamese MiGs. They will later get official credit for two kills, with one damaged. The victory was achieved by the men of a remarkable carrier, the USS Midway. Its proud history began in the months following World War II. During World War II, the aircraft carrier came to prominence with, amongst navies because its offensive reach was so much greater and more powerful than any other type of platform, including the battleship. When launched in September 1945, Midway was the epitome of a World War II carrier, but the race of technology would demand vast changes. Jet aviation posed a severe challenge to carrier aviation as it was at the end of World War II. Jet aircraft are heavier, they require more power to launch, they require more space to recover because of faster landing speeds. In 1955, Midway was rebuilt with several jet age innovations. The steam catapult to launch heavier aircraft, mirrored landing lights, and an angled deck. But it wasn't until March of 1965 in the Vietnam War that the Midway first saw combat. The cruise only lasted nine months, but it became clear Midway again needed upgrades to accommodate the rigors of an air war over Indochina. She was decommissioned in February 1966 and spent the next four years undergoing the most extensive modernization effort the Navy had attempted up to that time. After a four-year rebuild on the Midway, the Navy got a brand new carrier out of the deal. Uh, she went from a 2.8-acre flight deck to nearly four acres in flight deck. She could handle any of the aircraft that were currently on the Navy's drawing boards and was able to operate for extended periods of time and function every bit as efficiently as her large deck sisters. Midway is again ready to do battle over North Vietnam. May 18th, 1972, Yankee Station. A strike is launched from the deck of Midway. The aircraft assemble over the Gulf and push into the north. They'll target North Vietnamese infrastructure in the Haiphong area, part of an intense air campaign to stem the recent invasion of South Vietnam. Flying as part of the mission's combat air patrol are two F-4 Phantoms, led by Lieutenant Henry Bart Bartholomew, with his Rio, Lieutenant Oren Brown. 
I got put on the mission that afternoon as a spare aircraft. The lead aircraft uh, had hydraulic problems on the catapult, so it had to be taxied off the catapult. We were launched, consequently. Bartholomew's wingman is Lieutenant Pat Arwood, with his backseater, Lieutenant Mike Taco Bell. Our mission was to position ourselves between Haiphong and Kemp Airfield to interdict any mix that might challenge the strike force. Our mantra became MIGs in May for Midway. And we had that written on the blackboard in the ready room in big letters, and, and so we were all convinced that we were going to do it. As the Phantoms approach Kep Airfield, their radio crackles to life. Bandits in the area. Their pulse quickens. They begin a slow descent. Bart Bartholomew scans the sky, sure to call out any threat to his wingman, Pat Arwood. As I looked north to clear his 6 o'clock position, I was able to see a couple of silver aircraft. And I knew that we didn't have anything that was painted that silver. So I knew they were mixed. The Phantoms prepare for combat. It will be a baptism of fire. In their first mission over the north, they'll get their chance to score MiGs in May for Midway. May 18, 1972. Two F-4 Phantom crews from the USS Midway are about to taste air combat over North Vietnam for the first time. Above Kep Airfield, they've spotted two MiG-19s. We took off after. I wanted Pat to be about 3,000 feet above me and cover me as I went down after. Arwood pitches up. Bartholomew noses down and banks right. Roaring in over Kep, Bartholomew rolls left into position behind the enemy. They became aware of him. They both pickled off their external wing tanks. There was fuel streaming out of their wing tanks. So my thought was, seeing that, that they still had fuel in their wing tanks, so they probably had full internal fuel just like us. I followed them as best I could. I didn't quite have the energy to pull inside them. In order to keep my energy up, I had to stay sort of nose slightly behind and not pulling quite as many Gs as they were pulling inside my turn. Basically, your nose is pointed instead of ahead of the aircraft, it's pointed behind the aircraft, and you're sort of following him around like this in a lagging position. As Bart was pushing the MiGs around the circle, and they were staying in the circle, I was in a high position, and I did a series of high yo-yos. The yo-yo maneuvers will take advantage of the Phantom's raw power. Each move will improve his angle off the MiG's tail for a heat-seeking missile shot. I did the first high yo-yo, the dive down and back up. I did another dive down and back up, and I was starting to lose position. So on the third one, I knew that I was coming to the inside of the circle. I was starting to crowd Bart. I was coming too close to him. So at that point, I decided to fire. Uh, to break up the mix. I felt a missile come off the airplane and saw a MiG-19 that absolutely cranked it around so hard, and the missile went right by his tailplanes. The MiG split up. Bartholomew follows the wingman. Arwood stays on the leader. He buries the stick in his gut, straining to keep in trail of the tight-turning MiG-19. You pull hard and the plane is passing you. You're leaning forward in your straps. You're craning, turning very hard uh, to the left, uh, in this case to the left, to try to see back over, over your shoulder. But he had turned so far inside of me that, that I just lost sight of it completely. Arwood's heart races as he searches frantically for the MiG. He 
He pitches vertical, climbing to 4,000 feet. Still no sign of the enemy. Meanwhile, Bartholomew chases the second MiG. I was losing enough energy, so I just knew that I had to get out and uh, gather more energy back. Bartholomew unloads G and quickly distances himself from the MiG. He extends to the west two miles before pitching back to re-enter the fight. He's gained precious airspeed, but lost sight of the bandit. Orrin still had sight, which is uh, a great testament to the value of having four eyes in a cockpit. So Orrin was able to talk me on to him. The MiG is at 10 o'clock low, sweeping left in an effort to maneuver into Bartholomew's six. Bartholomew's instincts kick in. He'll lure the enemy closer. Then, at the last possible second, he'll pop his nose up, hit his speed brakes and flaps, and force the MiG to overshoot. It's a bold maneuver that will turn the tables in an instant. Orrin's calling the MiG, and he's calling the MiG, and he's calling the MiG with position, clock code, and so forth. And I waited until the MiG got to be about 8.30 low, and I could see him start to pull his nose towards me. Bartholomew yanks the stick back and performs the maneuver. The heavy Phantom pitches up as the MiG is thrown outside of his turn. So I pop my speed brakes and my flaps for about five seconds and I put them right back in and I was about upside down like so and as I went to the outside of the turn now I'm slow he popped it right out in front of me and now we're canopy to canopy going just about straight up as they rocket into the air the MiG inches out in front of Bartholomew but the Phantom's airspeed is plummeting he can't keep climbing much longer Fortunately for me, he had the same problem, and he decided to dump his nose just a fraction of a second prior to when I did. So what happened was, at that point, he slid out slightly in front of me. I was, I couldn't have been more than 200 feet, 100 feet, 200 feet behind him. Way too close to shoot a missile. He's in perfect position for a gun kill. But the F-4 doesn't have a gun. He throttles back, carefully trying to separate himself for a missile shot without losing too much airspeed. To the east, Pat Arwood continues his anxious search. I kept looking, looking, and looking for MiGs, looking for my lead, looking for anybody that I could find. <laughs> and I didn't see him. So I was really getting concerned about that. I looked down and I see the runway at Kep Airfield with all these bomb craters that had been patched. And I'm thinking, if we go down here, it's not gonna be real friendly. Finally, at eight o'clock low, Arwood spots the MiG. His enemy rocks back and forth, apparently searching for the Americans. I was very impressed to, to see him at such low altitude doing those wing rolls. I was almost directly over him, so I actually eased my turn and flew ahead a little bit as he continued to turn. Then I overbanked, maybe 130 degrees of bank, and started pulling my nose down toward him. The Phantom swoops in on his unsuspecting prey. It looks like Arwood will have an easy kill. But abruptly, the MiG breaks. He apparently picked me up uh, when he was uh, left wing down. And then again, he made a very, very hard uh, left hand turn into me. Through the tight turn, the enemy again slips from view. But suddenly, Bart Bartholomew roars into the fight. Bartholomew is chasing his MiG here. 
our wood is here. His MiG has slipped out of view here. As Bartholomew flies past, Arwood's MiG will turn in pursuit. Bartholomew thunders through. Arwood's MiG rolls right. He reversed and then crossed across my nose. And as he crossed, then I was able to roll back into a perfect firing position. He was slightly above the horizon. I was maybe 10 degrees off his tail. The MiG's concern for his fellow pilot is his undoing. Arwood fires. It just came within maybe 10 feet or so to the right side of his tail, and it detonated. But initially, it didn't appear to be any damage to the plane. Pat says, geez, I missed. And about just as he said that, this big silver piece of fuselage came off. Looked out, boom. I see the MiG-19 up there, and a heavy wing rock, canopy comes off, and a seat comes out, and poof, here's this guy in the chute. Arwood's MiG disintegrates just behind Bartholomew. Seconds later, Bartholomew gets good tone on his heat-seeking sidewinder. His finger closes around the trigger. Incredibly, on their first mission over the north, Bartholomew and Arwood have scored MiGs in May for the Midway. Here we were, both of us, all we had to do is make a 90 degree starboard turn and we were right there in combat spread, three quarter mile apart, and we were heading east and we were heading out. The MiG killers beat a hasty retreat to the Gulf of Tonkin. The MiG kills are only a small part of Midway's contribution to the air war over Vietnam on its third combat cruise. Flying off its deck, F-4 Phantoms, A-6 Intruders, and A-7 Corsairs mined key harbors, struck petroleum reserves, and destroyed key infrastructure targets in the north. The advantage of having the carriers operating in the Gulf of Tonkin was that you were able to take an entire air group and send a couple of dozen aircraft against a single target relatively close to where that target was. So you would minimize the amount of warning that the air defense network the North Vietnamese had to react to that. Midway continued daily combat operations over the North through the end of May. And just six days after Bartholomew and Arwood's dogfight, another pair of Phantoms will find themselves in the most perilous situation American airmen can face, a perfectly executed North Vietnamese ambush. May 23rd, 1972. Two F-4 Phantoms from USS Midway soar over the North Vietnamese countryside. They're flying combat air patrol for a strike against targets in Hai Phong, part of the continued effort to cripple the invasion of South Vietnam. The flight lead is Lieutenant Commander Muggs McEwen, with his Rio, Lieutenant Jack Inch. Muggs and I, uh, I don't know, we had a certain we kind of hit it off early on. We had a sort of a warped sense of humor between us uh, in the cockpit. I used to tell him, I said, Jack, this is the only thing, I, I never wanted to die surprised. If my last conscious thought is what the hell was that, I'll, I'll hunt you through eternity and you'll never rest. Flying off Muggs's wing is Lieutenant Mike Rabb with his Rio, Lieutenant Junior Grade Ken Crandall. As they descend towards their cap station, their radio crackles to life. Media called them and said, we have a vector for bandits, 278, 70 miles. And Jack said, right I said, Jack, did he say bandits? He said, yeah, I think he did. I said, confirm bandits. He said, 
Hey, Oswald, this is Bullet. Can you confirm bandits? He said, Roger, I confirm bandits. You're cleared to arm, cleared to fire. That's the defining moment of a fighter pilot. Muggs adjusts his heading and moves toward the bandits, maintaining airspeed in minimum afterburner to conserve fuel. But their flight path takes them into the heart of enemy airspace, directly over Kep Airfield. I can remember thinking to myself, man, this wasn't in our game plan. I don't think uh, I like this very much. Suddenly, Muggs gets a visual on the bandits, MiG-19s. I looked down and on the glint of the cartridge down low were two airplanes coming at us. And so I said, uh, Talio, 200 ridge line, seven miles. And Jack says, let's get them, I'm right behind you. In combat spread, the Phantoms merge head on with the MiGs. Ground clutter prevents any radar lock. This dogfight will be decided the old-fashioned way. Fearless, the enemy streaks through the American formation. We had our fangs out, and oh boy, here's a quick kill, and we're going to get these guys. Muggs calls for a cross turn. When you pull up, and then you go this vertically and come back, it's a way of reversing course, and then you can keep your eye on the target. Muggs goes high. Rab goes low. But just as they enter the maneuver, disaster. Halfway through the turn, it was raining MiGs. Four MiG-17s scream in directly towards them. I said, oh, God. That's when I said they just called the bed and they raised us about four. And I said, well, Jack, let's go. And I said, it's going to be homicide. The Soviet-built MiG-17 is a swift and formidable opponent in close quarters combat. At low speed, it can easily outturn the Navy F-4 Phantoms. The Americans are here. The MiG-17s are in a diving attack here, trying to hit the Phantoms while they're busy chasing the MiG-19s here. They were coming down us. I said, oh, God, so we just started extending out. The lead MiG-17 roars past mugs, canopy to canopy. It passed so close, it, I mean, you could feel the airplane pass by. Muggs will move aggressively against the MiGs. He'll use a classic air combat maneuver called a low yo-yo. He'll rudder down, then pull the nose up, cutting inside the MiGs' turn and increasing his airspeed. Muggs stomps the rudder, heart pounding. He breathes in ragged gasps through the crushing maneuver. As he pulls his nose through the horizon, he spots a MiG-19 just in front of him. He smoothly switches targets, the best strategy when surrounded by enemies. Muggs's best option for a shot is to barrel roll to the outside, improving his angle off the MiG's tail. Muggs pitches up and rolls. He skillfully coordinates the stick, rudder, and throttles as he rolls again. But suddenly, everything changes. I saw a MiG-17 back at our 8 o'clock. And it wasn't shooting yet. It was coming up there, but he was gaining ground on us. So I told Muggs, I says, we got one at 8 o'clock, and he's starting to be a threat. We had this, this <laughs> working relationship where I said, Jack, don't ever tell me break right or break left. Or you just tell me what's back there. I do, the, I do the pilot stuff, you do the RO stuff. The MiG on their tail begins to pull lead. The enemy's heavy cannon looms menacingly. Muggs is too low to dive away. The North Vietnamese pilot has him cornered. May 23, 1972. F-4 Phantom pilot Muggs McEwen and his Rio Jack Ench are staring down the barrel of a gun, a MiG-17 locked on their tail. And he said, okay, that's it, Jack. Somebody's going to walk home. It's not going to be us. 
Desperate times call for desperate measures. Muggs has a patented last ditch maneuver for just this situation. He'll apply full forward stick and bottom rudder. Then, just as the enemy tries to compensate for the move, he'll pull hard back and boot top rudder. For a moment, the F-4 will depart or become uncontrollable and backflip. Muggs jams the stick forward and stomps the left rudder pedal, then pulls hard back. The F-4 tumbles. It's a maneuver as spectacular as it is gutsy, the domain of only the greatest fighter pilots. We departed the airplane at about, oh, 1,500 feet, and it tumbled end over end, and Jack is saying, what the hell are you doing? I'm trying to keep my eye on this MiG, and all of a sudden, I'm being thrown around in a cockpit, up, and I'm, I'm, what are you doing up there? Then all of a sudden, the, the airplane scooped out, and he was in control again, and uh, I'm looking back, and I finally got my eyes back there, looking, where's that MiG, and it's gone. And he said, there's one right in front of us. The astonished North Vietnamese pilot has been forced out in front of Muggs and Inch. Muggs gets good tone on his Sidewinder missile and fires. MiG-17 could turn on a dime, and he defeated the missile's striking solution. So one of our Sidewinders was gone. We had three left. The MiG-17 stays in his right turn, but Muggs can't pursue. He barrel rolls. With so many MiGs, he must keep moving, never sticking with one target for long. Just trying to keep my, my energy up and keep being, from being predictable. Muggs rolls out with another MiG-17 just off his nose. He gets good tone and fires a second AIM-9. But again, the tight-turning MiG defeats the missile lock. This time, you know, we're, well, this is probably on TV, so we won't say the words we were saying in the cockpit. But we were very frustrated at this point. I said, you're not going to give it to me, are you, God? We're going to have to go home and tell everybody making excuses how we missed four MiGs. But surrounded by the enemy, there's no time to reflect. The punishing fight goes on. I'm checking back six, and all of a sudden I see one at four o'clock. And this guy had made ground on us, and he was up there, and he was actually starting to shoot his 37 millimeter cannon at us. And I called him up, I said, four o'clock, tracking and shooting. And he looked back on it like that and said, holy expletive. Orange tracers rip past the canopy. Muggs breaks hard into the attack. When suddenly, the MiG ceases fire. He just pulled out in front of me here like this, and I looked up, and from my time in the MiG-17, it just went, you can't see me. Muggs has managed to slip into the MiG's blind spot under its nose. To turn the tables, he'll chop the throttle, push forward on the stick, and open the speed brakes. The gut-wrenching negative G maneuver and loss of speed will force the MiG out in front of him. It's another brilliant move by a brilliant pilot. Muggs jams the stick forward and cuts power. Bandit screams by in front of the Phantom. It was about 50 feet away from his cockpit. Where we could pick the guy out of a police lineup. The MiG noses down and rolls back and forth in an apparent effort to reacquire the elusive American. For the third time, Muggs gets good tone on his enemy and fires a sidewinder. He broke into the missile. I thought, oh, God, we missed again. And I was feeling the depths of despair, and all of a sudden, his tail came off. 
I saw the missile go by the airplane, and I saw it go off, and I think it was uh, proximity fuse. The piece of the airplane went off, and then pretty soon, the explosion, we saw the guy eject. So that was our first kill. After five agonizing minutes of superhuman maneuvering, Muggs and Inch have a kill. But there's no time to celebrate. They spot their wingman, Mike Rabb, in the weeds with a MiG in hot pursuit. I'm turning left and I see Mike Rabb. He's heading uh, north at the time with a MiG-17 all over him, just shooting. He's got tracers all around him. Rab is here. Muggs is here. He will guide Rab on a heading that will drag the North Vietnamese in front of Muggs. I said, okay, Mike, roll away from him and send out to the east. Rab drags the enemy MiG across his nose. Muggs pitches down. The expert MiG killer easily swings in on his enemy's six. The MiG's tailpipe glows crimson just off his nose, a perfect target against the empty sky. Muggs fires his fourth sidewinder of the day. The missile tracks straight and true. fork in the cockpit, we're looking out soaking wet from sweat and drinking all the water we had and pounding on the canopy going, we realize what we just did, we get two, two big ones. The rest of the MiGs have bugged out. They've lost their nerve in the face of such determined warriors. Euphoric, the Americans head back to the midway. But the fighting isn't over. Before the conflict ends, the enemy will strike over water and bring the war to the midway. January 12, 1973, the closing days of the Vietnam War. Two Navy phantoms catapult from midway into an overcast sky. They're flying BARCAP, a barrier combat air patrol between the coast of North Vietnam and Midway. They'll intercept any MiGs that head out over the water towards American ships in the Gulf. Flying lead is Lieutenant Vic Kovaleski and his Rio, Jim Wise. Flying off his wing is Lieutenant Pat Arwood with his Rio, Ensign Lynn Oates. They arrive on station, and after a short time, the air controller breaks in over the radio. There's a bandit airborne heading straight for Midway. It was a real threat to the Midway, not only MiGs, but even uh, surface craft to uh, come out to challenge the carrier, because it would be quite a prize to sink or damage the Midway. Now, she did have some point defense systems at the time, such as a surface-to-air missile defense battery. But just as in the Second World War, the primary defense for an aircraft carrier is her own embarked fighters. The air controller vectors them in the direction of the enemy MiG. As we were descending, Vic picked him up, it was about 11 o'clock position, and we were down in the 10,000 foot range. The MiG was maybe 12 miles or so. The MiG is heading toward the Americans. At two miles, the North Vietnamese spots the big phantoms and makes an about face. The MiG appeared to be heading toward us but he very quickly uh, reversed course and started heading uh, due north. The communist pilot is in no mood to fight. Kovaleski pitches up and cuts back right to improve his angle off the MiG's tail. The powerful Phantom closes on its prey. 
the mink breaks right to shake his pursuer. Kowaleski and Arwood must be cautious. Kowaleski closes to missile range. He gets good tone on his sidewinder and fires. Vic's first missile detonated by the tail. I'm sure that the MiG pilot knew that he was damaged. And it was probably more damage than we realized from a distance. Kowaleski fires another sidewinder. When the second missile flew up the tailpipe and it exploded, the MiG pitched up violently into 90 degree vertical position and just virtually stopped and rolled off to the right hand side and then uh, plummeted into the water. This will prove to be the last MiG kill of the Vietnam War. On January 27, 1973, the Paris Peace Accords are signed and American involvement in the Vietnam War comes to an end. Between 1965 and 1973, America claimed over 200 MiGs eight of which were downed by pilots of the USS Midway. Midway had the benefit in providing the platform from which the very first and the very last confirmed MiG kills in the entire Vietnam War were scored. Midway served throughout the Cold War, modernized again in 1986 and equipped with the new F-18 Hornet. She goes into combat for the last time in January 1991 as flagship of the Arabian Gulf Battle Force. During 43 days of combat, Midway flies 3,339 combat sorties, averaging 121 per day, delivering 2,000 tons of bombs and missiles on enemy targets. It is a stunning achievement and Midway's swan song. In 1991, right after the successful conclusion of Operation Desert Storm, it was decided that the Midway would be retired a few years ahead of schedule. Age was catching up with her, and the fact that she just was too small to be uh, operating uh, the carrier aircraft that we had in the inventory. After 47 years of service, Midway is decommissioned at Naval Air Station, North Island, San Diego, April 11, 1992. As testament to her proud service in Vietnam and the Persian Gulf, she was spared the scrapyard. It is now a museum in San Diego and is available for public viewing to uh, look at a ship that basically was a milestone in carrier aviation history. It is a fitting legacy for the men and women who served on Midway and the bold airmen who launched from her deck. Men who flew into hostile skies, faced determined and skilled opponents, and returned to Midway as MiG killers. They were told they were racially inferior. They were told they lacked the intelligence to handle modern fighter aircraft. They were not supposed to succeed. But in the face of bigotry and ignorance, the Tuskegee Airmen prevailed. With skill and bravery, this all-black fighter squadron shattered racist stereotypes. and their exploits became the stuff of legend. Now you're in the cockpit 
as red-tailed Mustangs take on swarms of Nazi fighters. Experience the battle. Dissect the tactics. Relive the dogfights of the Tuskegee Airmen. July 18, 1944. 66 red-tailed Mustangs of the 332nd Fighter Group, the Tuskegee Airmen, soar over the Po River Valley in northern Italy. Their mission, escort B-17 flying fortresses on their way to bomb an air base in Memmingen, Austria. Flying with 302 Squadron is Captain Wendell Pruitt and his wingman, Lieutenant Lee Archer. Pruitt was my man. Uh, that's it. If he had gone to hell, I would have followed him. Pruitt and Archer are known as the gruesome twosome. Pruitt, a gifted and supremely confident fighter pilot. Archer, a loyal wingman with great skill and determination of his own. We used to fly above the bombers and sort of weave over them because we were a little faster than them and were a little higher, uh, less resistant. Suddenly, someone calls out enemy aircraft at 3 o'clock low. Heading for the bombers, a single flight of four ME-109s. The gruesome twosome are sent into action. Archer follows Pruitt through a wide, swooping turn. The purpose of me being a wingman, I always thought, was to keep Pruitt's back end from getting trouble. Pruitt singles out one of the ME-109s. The German spots the danger and breaks. The Mustangs turn in pursuit, straining against the pull of G. Archer fights to stay in trail of his lead through the wild maneuvers. To follow him in a turn. And then when he straightened out, he'd make a little short burst. Tracers streak past the 109. The German breaks. The gruesome twosome stick with him. But soon, Archer senses that something is wrong. The other aircraft straightened out three times, and Pruitt didn't fire. And so I pulled up next to him and said, you know, what's going on? Pruitt signals that his guns are jammed. He motions for Archer to take the lead. Archer throttles up and closes on the enemy. The 109 jinks and dives, but to no avail. I made the burst, it hit him. Then the second burst hit in his right wing, and he bailed out. It is Lee Archer's first victory. I circled him until he landed. He was standing there with his chute, and I came down over him. I wiggled my wings first, and then pulled up into the slow roll before I turned off. It was all about how I thought about aerial combat in those times. But back with the rest of the 332nd, the fight is still raging. as many as 30 more ME-109s are attacking the bombers from all directions. <music> Lieutenant Clark
Clarence Lucky Lester hears his flight lead call over the radio. Bandits, three o'clock high. So at that point, flight leader calls punch tanks. That means drop your tanks, I'm gonna hit after the enemy. Lucky and the rest of his flight bank right on an intercept course. But then Lucky spots an even better target, a flight of 109s slightly below him. That training kicks in and reflexes take over and you're an animal and you're out for the kill, you're on the hunt, you're gonna get it done. The Germans have not yet spotted him. At 200 feet, he unleashes a torrent of machine gun fire. The airplane starts to smoke and it explodes. Pieces are flying all over, debris coming at him, he's dodging the debris. Lucky bobs and weaves through the flaming wreckage. Miraculously, his aircraft is unscathed. Off to his right, probably just done um, with the swivel of the head, left and right, he notices a, another 109. He peels over to the right, gets behind this second 109, and he gives him the works. The 109 shudders and smokes. Lucky deftly rolls over the top of the doomed German. He watches as the pilot throws back the canopy and leaps away. Lester has downed two aircraft, but the fight has carried him far away from the bombers. Skimming the peaks of the Italian Alps, he spots a 109 at two o'clock low. Altitude is a key with fighter pilots. They call it being on the perch. Like a bird on a perch, you see something down below, you dive on it. Therefore, with um, Lester being on the perch, he had the advantage. He could get in on that Messerschmitt before the Messerschmitt knew what was happening. Lucky rolls into a high-speed diving attack. His Merlin engine screams as the Mustang accelerates past 350 miles per hour. His finger closes around the trigger. A volley of tracers arc across the nose of the 109. The German breaks hard, rolling inverted in an attempt to evade the American. But the move is ill-advised. He's far too low. Lucky Lester watches in stunned amazement as the 109 slams into a hillside. Lester soars over the wreckage, exhilarated by the intense dogfight. Alone, he's accounted for three enemy aircraft. The rest of the 332nd downed nine more for a total of 12. Their most successful day of air combat to date. It is a milestone for the Tuskegee Airmen, a fighter group whose battle against the German Luftwaffe is only half the story. Deemed by the War Department as inferior to whites and unable to handle the intricacies of modern weaponry, black soldiers were relegated to support roles. Flying fighter planes was out of the question. It was thought over the objection of Hap Arnold, who was in charge of the Air Corps at that time, that blacks didn't have the ability to do complicated things or leadership, etc. We knew that was wrong. Under pressure from the black press, the NAACP, and even his own wife, President Roosevelt relented in 1939 and ordered the civilian pilot training program to be open to black students who wish to become civilian pilots. In December of 1940, the War Department followed suit 
and appropriated $1 million to build a suitable base to train black airmen at the Tuskegee Institute in Alabama. They called the effort to train these men an experiment. The men bonded immediately, imbued with a sense of common purpose and racial pride. Although the Army didn't believe in our capability, they didn't change the training standards, and that was a plus for us, that we were able to meet the standards and perform successfully. And World War II gave us a chance to go into combat units and do a first-class job so that the larger population would realize how silly uh, and stupid segregation was. In April of 1943, the first full squadron of African-American fighter pilots, the 99th Fighter Squadron, received orders for deployment to the Mediterranean Theater of Operations. By June of 1944, the 99th had joined three other all-black fighter squadrons. Together, they comprised the 332nd Fighter Group, known to history as the Tuskegee Airmen. August 24th, 1944. American B-24 and B-17 bombers of the 5th Bomb Wing approach their target, Artovice Airfield in Czechoslovakia. Escorting them are 52 red-tailed Mustangs of the 332nd Fighter Group, the Tuskegee Airmen. Among them is Lieutenant Charles McGee, flying a P-51C nicknamed Kitten, after his wife. McGee leads a flight of four. We were out to the side and slightly above the bombers. Our squadron was on that date operating, as I say, out to the side, weaving back and forth sufficient to be able to look around at all angles, not just flying a straight, straight line. McGee will soon square off against a battle-hardened foe. Over a German airfield set ablaze by American bombs, McGee will find himself in the fight of his life, a fierce encounter against a tenacious enemy that will test his combat prowess as never before. August 24, 1944. Lieutenant Charles McGee of the 332nd Fighter Group, the Tuskegee Airmen, flies escort for American heavy bombers. Their target is a German airfield in Pardubice, Czechoslovakia. McGee and the rest of the 332nd have battled hatred and ignorance for the privilege of flying combat. Each mission is a chance to prove their worth to a bigoted military hierarchy. As Pardubice comes into view on the horizon, McGee searches for the enemy. Attacking a, a aerodrome like that was a great way to scare up some enemy opposition, and that's what happened. McGee's squadron commander calls out two FW-190s at 4 o'clock high. My flight was dispatched to go after them. They were actually attempting to dive into the bomber stream. McGee and his flight turn to engage the 190s. They're about to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Nazi Germany's most advanced single-engine fighter. The Fock Wolf 190 is a tough and agile opponent, heavily armed with two 13-millimeter machine guns and four 20-millimeter cannons. McGee flies an early model P-51 Mustang, the P-51C. Even though it lacks the refinements of later Mustang models, it is still a formidable fighter aircraft. With a top speed of 440 miles per hour and armament consisting of four 50 caliber machine guns mounted in the wings. 
McGee's P-51C is faster and more maneuverable. But the FW-190 is more rugged and has better armament. The 190s are here. McGee and his men are here. McGee's best option is a slicing right turn that will position him directly on his opponent's tail. I took off after the plane to try to get a position to fire on him, and the plane continued in, in a dive. The Mustangs close with the enemy. But as soon as the 190s spot the danger, they split up. McGee takes his wingman, Roger Romine, with him after one of the fleeing Germans. The desperate German pilot fights for his life, rolling, diving, jinking, anything to shake the Mustang. The enemy aircraft went for the deck as fast as it could and started engaging in a series of evasive maneuvers, trying to get Charles into a scissors battle, going back and forth and trying to shake him that way. They're doing a little turny, we call it jinking around, to uh, get us either to overrun them or lose us. I was able to control speed enough to stay, but trying to close to a firing range because you're just wasting ammunition if you try to fire too soon. McGee exploits the P-51's speed advantage and closes on his enemy. But the dogfight is getting dangerously close to Pardubice. The German pilot dove towards the airfield and led McGee across the airfield, which was, by this point, burning from the bombing raid. And again, the idea was for the German pilot not to engage McGee in some some air-to-air -air combat, but to drag him across an area where the German flak could open fire and perhaps take out the American fighter off his tail. I can remember over the aerodrome, I could see one of the hangars on fire and some planes uh, on the field. Flak bursts all around him. The anti-aircraft gunners are zeroing in. McGee will soon be forced to break off. But suddenly, the German makes a critical mistake. He made the fatal turn uh, going around to the right, which appeared to me he might have been trying to escape through some of the smoke and so on that was coming from the field. But it uh, was the wrong turn because I happened to be right in the right position at that time to. Uh, uh, to f effectively fire on him. McGee opens fire. His 450 cals make quick work of the German. The 190 shudders sickeningly, then rolls. The wounded Fock Wolf hits the ground in a brilliant explosion. That was my first victory, and of course, right then, your adrenaline is pumping pretty well, and like I say, you know there's fire uh, from, from the uh, ground, and so the idea was to uh, not fly a straight path, but keep moving, but f flying away at low altitude to get away from the, the uh, guns that were around the airport. Romine, who had been separated from McGee through the chase, rejoins his flight lead. The victorious Mustang pilots return to their position in the bomber stream. The 332nd continued flying escort for bombers through the rest of the summer of 1944. Their reputation for disciplined and effective fighter escort grew. Stars and Stripes, which is a military newspaper that came out every day, would talk about our missions. And they would talk about the all-Negro 332nd Fighter Group and how they had protected the bombers and how we were doing such a great job in protecting the bombers. The 332nd flew mission after mission. 
protecting bombers of the 15th Air Force as they struck railroad bridges in northern Italy and oil refineries in Romania. They were sent all over Eastern Europe to strafe airfields and marshalling yards. But German air activity had decreased and sightings were rare. The Tuskegee Airmen went the entire month of September without scoring a victory. But in October 44, the Luftwaffe returned in force. On the 12th, the gruesome twosome of Wendell Pruitt and Lee Archer will be back in action. In the midst of a sprawling dogfight, Archer will make history. He will become the first and only Tuskegee Airman to make ace. October 12, 1944. A squadron of red-tailed P-51 Mustangs of the 332nd Fighter Group soar over Lake Balaton in southern Hungary. After completing an escort mission, they're returning to base in Italy. Among them is Captain Wendell Pruitt and his wingman, Lieutenant Lee Archer, the gruesome twosome, as they are known. As they reach the southern tip of the lake, tiny specks appear on the horizon, a swarm of German ME-109s. There were more German airplanes in the air than I've ever seen before. Kind of made a little side decision, well, this might be it. Pruitt, Archer, and the rest of the Red Tails don't flinch. We didn't run or anything like that. We said, OK, they're up here. Uh, it's as many of them as it is of us. Uh, we'll take them on. Throttles firewall, machine guns armed. The Tuskegee airmen rip through the German formation. The skies above Lake Balaton explode with the roar of piston engines and the staccato burst of machine guns and cannon. With the battle raging all around them, Pruitt and Archer select a target. They'll make a head-on pass with a German 109 just off their nose. The gruesome twosome streak past the enemy. Archer drops in trail of Pruitt as they roll left in pursuit. He'd pull ahead and I'd pull right behind him and try to stay on him. He was a heck of a pilot, and just staying there sometime was a full-time job. Pruitt's tight turn takes the German by surprise. The P-51's 450 cals open up. The pilot leaps from the smoking plane. Just as they pull away from their first victory, another 109 roars in from 3 o'clock high. He pulled in to take a side shot at Pruitt. And Pruitt slowed down. I guess he chopped throttle or something. I know I did. Pruitt's quick reaction saves him from certain death. Reducing his speed causes the 109 to overshoot to the side. With careful maneuvering, he can flush the 109 out in front of him. Archer lets his lead do the work. Pruitt manages to force the 109 out. But suddenly, another German bursts into the fight. And the other one came in to get on Pruitt's tail, not realizing that my only job at that time was to protect Pruitt's tail. So it's the ME-109, it's Pruitt shooting at him, it's the ME-109 shooting at Pruitt, 
And there's me shooting at him. Archer expertly leads his mark and fires. The 109 tumbles, smoke belching from the wounded plane. Seconds later, Pruitt fires a long burst into his 109. Another victory for the gruesome twosome. But they're not done yet. They dive back into the furball. He made a screaming turn back to where all the other aircraft was. And I really wasn't sure that was a great idea at the time. Pruitt instantly spots a target amidst the chaos. Another 109 is positioned just off his nose. We got into the other airplanes. Another one picked him up, and he, uh, he made a head-on pass on him with me peppering behind him. Pruitt and Archer roar past the German, guns blazing. Archer follows Pruitt through another crushing left turn. I guess I was lagging a little bit. Another one came right in behind him. Again, we have the same thing. They're very experienced flying together, so the odds are pretty good that Pruitt had figured out a way to present those German fighters to his wingmen, his, his targets. They were suckers. Uh, they didn't see the second airplane a thousand yards behind, armed to the teeth. Again, Archer's 50 cals spark to life. When I first started firing, he realized that someone was behind him, and then he broke kind of right and left, but he didn't break and make a big turn. But the Germans' evasive tactic is futile. Archer speeds past the wreckage. He's now one victory away from making ace, with plenty of targets to choose from. At that time, it was so many airplanes in the air that I say somehow I lost Wendell O. Pruitt, but it's not true. I saw an aircraft that I could take on who was coming my way. Archer is here. The 109 is here. Archer can easily initiate a head-on pass by banking to the right. In an instant, the adversaries merge. They break into each other and begin circling. Whoever pulls tighter will win the contest. The 109 inches closer to firing position. The German's heavy cannon is poised to unleash lethal retribution on Lee Archer. The American has seconds to react. October 12, 1944. Tuskegee Airmen pilot Lee Archer is in a grueling turning fight with a German ME-109 and slowly losing the advantage. But suddenly, he spots a second 109. I look out to the right, and I see this guy all by himself, a pigeon. And he was flying straight and level. Archer breaks instinctively. Since then, a lot of people say, well, when you turned on the second aircraft, what about the guy behind you? I forgot all about him. I think that's how I got my left wing hit. And it must have been a cannon shot because it had a hole in the wing, huge, under the bottom. Archer latches onto his target.
the German counters by pitching over into a steep dive. He's headed for the safety of an air base. But the maneuver fails. The determined Mustang pilot will not be denied his fifth victory. Lee Archer opens the throttle and pulls away. He's bested the German, but he's broken formation with his flight lead, Wendell Pruitt, strictly forbidden for a wingman. I guess the only thing with my mind, how do I explain to Pruitt uh, how this happened? <laughs> now alone and low on ammo, he heads back to base. Archer's three victories on October 12th bring his war total to five. It is an historic achievement made by a skilled and aggressive fighter pilot. The Tuskegee Airmen now have an ace. The 332nd Fighter Group continued in their escort role through the fall of 1944 and winter of 1945. By the beginning of March, the 332nd had accrued a total of 74 air-to-air -air victories. But as the war dragged on, a new threat appeared in the skies above Germany a foe that threatened to tip the balance of power in the air, the ME-262 jet fighter. A generational leap in aircraft technology, the ME-262's 100 mile per hour speed advantage over the Mustang and its heavy armament made it a lethal threat to American bombers. But in one of the war's great ironies, the Tuskegee Airmen, once maligned as unfit to comprehend modern technology, will draw blood against the seemingly invulnerable ME-262. March 24, 1945. The drone of aircraft engines echoes through the skies of central Germany. A bomber train of 200 B-17 Flying Fortresses descend on Germany, targeting a tank assembly plant in Berlin. Mustangs of the 332nd Fighter Group fly escort. Just outside Berlin, the Red Tails are scheduled to be relieved by another unit, the 31st Fighter Group. It turned out that they got caught in the weather. We were told, keep on to target. We had enough fuel, barely, to get back. The 332nd stays with the bombers. But as they near the target, the Americans spot the distinct contrails of twin-engined ME-262s. All of a sudden, we begin to hear bogeys, bogeys. And that's where we began to see streaks up in the air. We were flying about 24, about 26. These streaks going out and said, oh, shit. So in my case, I said, be alert, be alert, be alert. I'm taking over. The 262s won't risk a frontal assault. They'll break up in small groups and attack along the length of the bomber train. A flight of four streaks in, lobbing cannon shells at long range before any of the Mustangs can engage. As the Germans break away, one 262 gets careless. He flies right in front of P-51 pilot Lieutenant Earl Lane. Lane reacts instinctively, breaking away to pursue the enemy jet. In this situation, Lane fired a tremendous long-range deflection shot. He's got range and he's got deflection, two factors that really conspire to throw off a lot of pilots' aims. At a range of 2,000 feet, he opens fire. Rounds slam into the enemy jet, wounding the pilot. The German pilot pulls his clipped warbird skyward and launches himself from the canopy. One down, but there are more 262s attacking the American heavies. 
one of the German jets makes a high-speed pass. But as he pulls out of his run, he flies over the cockpit of Mustang pilot Charles Brantley. Brantley was able to latch onto him and open fire from much closer range than Lane was. And again, scored kills on the ME-262. Despite its speed, the airplane was relatively easy to bring down if you get hit with 650s, and that's what happened. Further back in the bomber stream, the ME-262 attack reaches a fever pitch. Like a pack of wolves, the German jets stalk their prey from a distance before they pounce. Lieutenant Roscoe Brown, flying lead in a flight of four, cranes his neck, searching for any threat to his sector of the bomber train. I was headed in a left-hand turn. All of a sudden, I saw these jets coming up from 7 o'clock and 5 o'clock. Coming up. The 262s close on the bombers at over 400 miles per hour. Roscoe Brown and his men are all that stand in their way. Without a moment's hesitation, Brown calls drop tanks and turns to engage, flying headlong into the fight. March 24, 1945. The Tuskegee Airmen have drawn first blood against World War II's most advanced fighter, the German ME-262. Now, Roscoe Brown has sighted another flight of 262s, threatening the bomber stream he's charged to protect. When you have to decide what you're going to do and where you're going to do it, you go on as a fighter pilot. It's all reaction. I knew it was a jet. I knew it was fast. I knew what I had to do. I said, let's go. You don't, you don't internalize. There's no, no analysis there. Brown and his flight are here. The Germans are here. Well, I developed a little thing where I would pull up, give it full power, pull it way up, stick back, right rudder, and then flip it. Boom, go down, and you have almost a stalling point. So when I flip it and push it down, the speed increases, and then I would pull it back up. The move is a modified split S that gives Brown an extra boost of speed while putting him on an intercept course with the 262s. When I came out of the split S, I could see him. He was coming up. And this is within fractions of a second. Roscoe Brown seizes the opportunity. The German jet flames, shedding debris before the pilot bails out. It's a confirmed victory. The third ME-262 down that day. But it wasn't over then. Because I'd made these radical moves and had gotten this guy, I had, in a sense, lost my wingman. My wingman was chasing somebody else. When I'm up over Berlin, 25,000 feet, and I'm looking around for somebody to join. And I see this P-51 silhouette about 12 o'clock. I said, well, look, I didn't have radio contact. I didn't know who he was. I said, look, let me join you. Roscoe Brown moves in closer to what he believes to be a friendly P-51. So as I started making a circle, I saw that the P-51 had a German cross on it. We knew that the Germans had captured some P-51s and were infiltrating some of the formations to try to get closer. And so I said, well, let me go get it. Brown goes on the attack. But the German takes evasive action.
Brown pulls the stick in tight, straining to pull lead on his enemy. So I started pulling tight, tight, tight. I'm gaining on him. And then I looked at my fuel gauge. My fuel gauge was a little bit below half. I said, well, I got two things to do. One, I can get this guy and get this victory and parachute and hope they don't kill me. Or the other, I can say bye-bye and go home. So I said, look, I let him go, firewalled it, get it back south, and I flew about 700 miles by myself over enemy territory. Roscoe Brown returns to base victorious. The day's tally is three confirmed ME-262 victories, three probables, and two damaged. It's one of the outstanding feats for any group during the war against the ME-262. The Mustang is a great aircraft, but it shouldn't have been shooting down ME-262s at this rate. In addition to this stunning achievement, the Tuskegee Airmen later find out the Berlin mission was the longest escort of the war. We did show them. Actually, we were very damn good in our escort. And later we got the presidential unit citation. The guys were really, really so happy. By war's end, the 332nd had downed 108 enemy aircraft received 744 air medals, 150 distinguished flying crosses, 14 bronze stars, and one silver star. But despite the accolades for their efforts overseas, the Tuskegee Airmen return to a segregated America, indifferent to their achievements. I'm coming down the gangplank from a boat that brought me back to the States. And at the bottom of the, of the gangplank is a sign that said, colored troops to the right, uh, white troops to the left, separated again. And uh, I, at that time, I said, well, you know, this is a pity. But the war efforts of the Tuskegee Airmen would not be forgotten. Our experience dispelled the myths and biases that had been a part of Army policy on our capability and how we would be used, so it brought about a change. In 1948, by order of President Harry Truman, the armed forces of the United States were integrated. The war record of the Tuskegee Airmen in the skies of Europe had shaken the foundations of entrenched American racism. This small but resolute group of African-American men, refined by hardship, danger, and adversity, had proven the fundamental injustice of a segregated military. You got to know inside that racism is wrong. You got to know inside that you have the capacity like anybody else. And when given the opportunity, you will overcome. We had accomplished something important once given the opportunity and the importance that this shows that it's not happenstance of birth or color of skin that's important. Uh, it's really what uh, Martin Luther King really gave our country, content of character.